So today our topic is about stroke. So let's define what is stroke. According to the World Health Organization, stroke is defined as a clinical syndrome consisting of rapidly developing clinical signs of focal or global disturbance of cerebral function with symptoms lasting 24 hours or longer or leading to death with no apparent cause other than of vascular origin and includes cerebral infarction, intracerebral hemorrhage and subarachnoid hemorrhage. In simpler words, we can say that a stroke occurs when the blood supply to the part of your brain is interrupted or severely reduced, depriving the brain tissue of oxygen and food. Within minutes, brain cells begin to die. It's caused by the blockage of the blood flow or rupture of an artery to or in the brain. Types of stroke. So there are two main types of stroke. One is ischemic stroke and the second one is hemorrhagic stroke. Ischemic stroke. This is due to the blockage of a brain artery by an embolus or by thrombosis. If it lasts for less than 24 hours, it is a transient ischemic attack. About 85% of the strokes are ischemic strokes. There are two main types. One is a thrombotic stroke and embolic stroke. Next, we're going to talk about what is hemorrhagic stroke. It occurs when a blood vessel in your brain leaks or ruptures. Brain hemorrhages can result from many conditions that affect your blood vessels, including uncontrolled blood pressure, that is hypertension, and weak spots in your blood vessel walls, which is aneurysm. There are two main types. One is intracerebral hemorrhage and subarachnoid hemorrhage. So the first picture here shows you about hemorrhagic stroke and the second picture here shows about ischemic stroke. Now let's move on to the types of ischemic stroke. You have two main types. One is thrombotic stroke and what one is embolic stroke. So let's talk about what is thrombotic stroke. So thrombotic stroke is where a blood clot forms in the main brain artery or within the small blood vessels deep inside the brain. The clot usually forms around atherosclerotic plaques. Next, we're going to talk about embolic stroke. Embolic stroke is a blood clot, air bubble or fat globule which forms within a blood vessel elsewhere in the body and is carried to the brain. So here is a picture of thrombotic stroke and embolic stroke. So now we're going to talk about the types of hemorrhagic strokes. You have intracerebral hemorrhage and subarachnoid hemorrhage. Intracerebral hemorrhage. In the intracerebral hemorrhage, a blood vessel in the brain bursts and spills in the surrounding brain tissue, damaging the blood vessels. High blood pressure, trauma, vascular malformations, use of blood thinning medications and other conditions may cause intracerebral hemorrhage. Next, we are going to talk about the subarachnoid hemorrhage. In the subarachnoid hemorrhage, an artery on or near the surface of your brain bursts and spills into the space between the surface of your brain and your skull. This bleeding is often signaled by sudden severe headache. It's caused by the rupture of aneurysm. So here is a picture of intracerebral hemorrhage and subarachnoid hemorrhage. So let's now move on to the risk factors of stroke. So you have two main types. One is a modifiable risk factor and next is the non-modifiable risk factors. Modifiable risk factors are something which can be changed by using appropriate measures and non-modifiable risk factors are something which cannot be changed. So what are the risk factors which come under modifiable risk factors? Let's see that. So the first one is hypertension, diabetes, hyperlipidemia, atrial fibrillation, sickle cell disease, obesity, smoking or alcohol abuse, hormone replacement therapy, previous transient ischemic attack, viral infections or conditions that cause inflammation and other cardiac diseases. Non-modifiable risk factors include age, sex, race or ethnicity, family history and genetics. So now let's move on to the general signs and symptoms of stroke. So the first one is sudden numbness or weakness in the face, arm or leg, especially on one side of the body, sudden confusion, trouble speaking or difficulty in understanding the speech, sudden trouble seeing in one or both eyes, Sudden trouble walking, dizziness, loss of balance or lack of coordination. Sudden severe headache with no known cause. And we should call the emergency helpline right away if you or someone else has any of the symptoms. Acting fast is a key for stroke. Acting fast can help stroke patients get the treatments they desperately need. The stroke treatments that work best are available only if the stroke is recognized and diagnosed within 3 hours of the first symptoms. Stroke patients may not be eligible for these if they don't arrive at the hospital in time. If you think someone may be having a stroke, act fast and do the following simple test. So F stands for face. Ask the person to smile. Does one side of the face droop? 
A stands for arms. Ask the person to raise both arms. Does one arm shift downward? S stands for speech. Ask the person to repeat a simple phrase. Is the speech slurred or strange? T stands for time. If you see any of these signs, call 911 or any other emergency helpline in your country right away. Now, signs and symptoms depending on the arterial lesions. So, we are going to talk about lesion to each artery in the brain. So, first is the lesion to the anterior cerebral artery. Let's see what all signs and symptoms you can see. So, the first one is the paralysis or weakness of the contralateral foot and leg due to the involvement of the motor leg area. Second is the cortical sensory loss in the contralateral foot and leg. Third is the gait apraxia and impairment of gait and stance. Abulia akinetic mutism, slowness and lack of spontaneity. Urinary incontinence which usually occurs with bilateral damage in the acute phase. Now what happens when there is a lesion to the anterior communicating artery? We find visual field defects and if there is a lesion to the internal carotid artery, there are four uh, signs and symptoms you can see. So the first one is the paralysis of the entire opposite half to the face and body, temporary blindness in one eye, sensation may be lost on the other side of the body, memory may be impaired, urinary incontinence is another possible symptom. Now what happens if there is a lesion to the posterior cerebral artery? We find there is contralateral loss of pain and temperature sensation, there will be visual field defects, ipsilateral deficit of oculomotor nerve which is the third cranial nerve and then you have contralateral deficits of facial nerve which is the seventh cranial nerve. If there is a lesion to the posterior communicating artery, you will find uh, nystagmus which is invol involuntary side movements of the eye. If there is a lesion to the basilar artery, we may find pupillary and oculomotor abnormalities, dysarthria and dysphagia. If there is a lesion to the middle cerebral artery, we may find paralysis or weakness of the contralateral face and arm, sensory loss of the contralateral face and arm, aphasia and contralateral neglect syndrome. So this is a picture of the circle of villus and this is basically the blood supply to the brain. So you can find all the arteries here. Now let's move on to the pathophysiology of stroke. Brain requires of constant supply of glucose and oxygen delivered by blood. Brain receives 15% of the resting output and accounts for 20% of the total body oxygen consumption. Cerebral blood flow is maintained via autoregulation. Thus, the brain is highly aerobic tissue where oxygen is a limiting factor. Next is about the blood flow. If zero leads to the death of the brain tissue within 4 to 10 minutes, less than 16 to 18 uh, per 100 grams tissue per minute is infarction in an hour. Less than 20 ml uh, per 100 milligram tissue per minute leads to ischemia without infarction unless prolonged for several hours or day. Investigations or clinical findings. You will find first is the CT scan or MRI which is magnetic resonance imaging. Then you have ECG, CXR which is chest radiograph, CBC which is complete blood count and next is plasma glucose. Now let's talk about the medical management of stroke. So the first one is supportive management, airway, temperature, blood pressure, blood glucose and cardiac assessment. Second is about thrombolysis which can be done intravenously or intra-arterially and third one is antiplatelet drugs. Fourth is anticoagulant drugs. Fifth is hemodilution and vasodilators and induced hypertension. Sixth is neuroprotective agents. Last one is about the physiotherapy goals. We have short term goals and long term goals. So the short term goals is to improve the bed mobility, to improve functional activities, to improve balance, to normalize the muscle tone, to teach transfer techniques, to educate the patient. Long term goals improve uh, ADL activities, to improve the or to regain the balance in sitting and standing position. Physiotherapy management. You have first is the bed mobility which increase the ability to roll or move in bed, sit or stand, active exercise, active assisted exercise, active resisted exercise and resisted exercises. 
Next is about improving balance and coordination, retrain normal patterns of movement, increase the affected arm and leg function, gait training and posture correction, increase the independence and quality of life, reduce the risk of falls. Thank you.